We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. As a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to PML. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right, so, we're going team by team. I would be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I gonna get sued? We got legal on this. I like football, like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast, Steve Pelzola, Sam Monson. We're here for our Wednesday show. A little dim in the studio here. Are we missing a light somewhere? That no, it looks good. It looks good. That's pretty blinding. It's our midweek show, my favorite show of the week, Sam, because we get to hear everybody's emails. I've had to rewrite the uh, my PFF contract to, to limit the number of lights that are allowed to shine directly oh, that's on my bald-ass head. That's the problem. Great. Great. Might hide my grades, too. So, uh, yeah. Hey, what are we doing today? Lots of exciting things, Steve. We got a charity update because there's actually movement on the baseball front. Um, We have a bunch of emails from the mailbag, one of which you're going to need to read because there's a bunch of y'alls in there, and we've established that I don't say that word anymore. say that. Um, And then we have a a special guest previewing Thursday Night Football. The great Mike Ryan Ruiz of the Levitard Show is coming on to help us talk about the Dolphins, the heat in Miami, and uh, that's the weather rather than the basketball team though they got a reference as well, and the matchup with the Bengals. So, action-packed show, Steve. Action-packed. I love it. So, yeah, Dolphins-Bengals preview coming at the very end here. But first, uh, we all know that you guys all raised the money. We appreciate it to uh, to see if Sam could throw 60 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've been practicing. I, no, I wouldn't go that far. I went to a park with my neighbor with a radar gun just to find out where we were, you know? Just, just a level set. Because I've been pretty confident the whole way, and you've been equally confident that there's, you've been equally confident that my confidence is misplaced. So I was like, well, I need to know. I, I just need, I need to see a number and find out what what any of this is, because I have no clue. So we went out there. Now, the first thing I would say is that after you know a while of, of pitching, quote unquote, there's a lot of parts of your body start to hurt, and weird parts, nothing yeah, to do think? with your arm. Yeah. Like I could feel it in the elbow a bit later, but like my hip had thrown out like I was a 90-year-old man. A couple of days later, like, every muscle in my core was like, what just happened to me? Yeah, you don't – I mean, I spent Weird. hours working on <laughs> front hip, internal rotation, yeah. thoracic mobility, uh-huh. and things like that just to make sure I could throw the ball hard and stay healthy. You think you just roll out there and not feel like you were just in a car crash the day before? Of course. Yeah. That's what happens when you pitch. Your whole body's into it, and it hurts. So the upshot the, – the, the bottom line takeaway from all this is that it is – firmly positioned on a knife edge heading into the real thing whenever Solfaro finds us a stadium or a mound, you know, 60 don't feet in a mound. It. Don't lose the drama. I here. haven't. I've said whenever, if ever. I don't care. I just need – we need a new place to do it, and he's working on it. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, the point being, the bottom line here, good news for you, 60 did not appear on the radar gun. Yeah. Good news for me, we got very close. Very close. And – there's a lot of mileage. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of absolute garbage technique. For example, there's something wrong with my grip of throwing a ball, and every ball comes out like a curveball. Yeah. Whether no matter what I do to it, every ball comes out like a curveball. So that's not good. Like my five-year-old. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it comes out with pace as a curveball, just less pace than I need it to. And that feels like something I can fix between now and the thing. Yeah. You know? I mean, I could fix it for you, and it'd probably be worth four miles an hour right yeah. off the bat. So. That's unfortunate because you're the one person that I think is unlikely to do that. Probably don't want to help fix it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the I other thing is work. I wasn't throwing from a mound, which you seem to think will, is, is worth miles per hour as well. It usually does help. Now, uh, the problem is we might not be able to pitch from a mound if we get somebody's stadium. If you were pitching, the mound and the incline should help. Yeah. If you're like crow hopping, not, not that I, I stuck to the rules. No crow hopping was involved. Just okay. a single step and you know long. I mean, I would, I was confident enough. I'd let you crow hop, but it sounds like that might. That was against. The, that was specifically against the rules as determined by 
Matt Money Smith, the Chargers uh, play-by-play guy, oh, that's right? right? Which is where this yeah. sort of spawned from. So we should get money on the show too. Oh well, if we hit sixty, I will absolutely be hitting money up and saying, "Sir, donate to that Go and Fund Me because I have proved you wrong." So here's what we're gonna do: if you hit sixty, we're gonna go to all the doubters. Oh the yeah, haters. I will be individually, gonna, but we'll have them on the show. We'll just call <laughs> them up on the show. Say I did it. You do like a victory. Like you get thirty seconds, and then we hang up on them, and then go to the next person. No, no, no. you, you. I did it. You get the victory lap, and then how much will you be donating to the GoFundMe? How much will you be donating, yeah. and they go to the next person? So we can we'll have a victory lap. Show anyway, for you. so I'm sticking to the rules with the no crow hop thing. Now, if we get to the day and I everything is topped out at fifty eight, fifty nine, I might crow hop at the end just to try and hit the sixty, and we'll 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 then have to argue about whether that counts or not. But anyway, the point well, being, we're on a knife edge. We're very close. And there's some there's some fixable things in the technique. Not, I for one, not that I know how to fix them, but there's some fixable things. I would say Google it, but man, there's some trash throwing coaches out there on uh, YouTube. It also there. feels like it's one of the, it's like a golf swing. You know what I mean? It's like when you spend when you spend the entire time thinking about the 17 different things in your swing that need to be right. To ju- you're you're screwed. It's too much thinking no. involved. I need to just, you need cues. You need cues. I just need to be. I needed one thing maybe. Otherwise, I think the next thing. Well, what if I teach you after the fact and get you to 70? You know, like, what if I could get you to 70? That would annoy me a lot, I think, if if I hit 58, you know. And then I work lose, with you to get have to, to the, lose the bet. Yeah. And then in, like, the space of 20 minutes, you get me up to 70. That would upset me that would quite a lot, be, I think. That would be pretty fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, also, don't forget, PFF has an app. I've already seen a lot of the new cool stuff that's coming soon. So get there right now. Download the app. we got industry-leading fantasy football advice, our exclusive betting dashboards, the latest premium football analysis, especially from Sam. Just read all of Sam's articles, share them, and uh, tell your friends. So grab the PFF app right now. It continues to get better every single day, literally every single day. PFF app. Go check it out in the app store. All right, Sam, it's email time. And Mm -hmm. how do you get these emails sent to us? Well, you email at nflpodcast at pff.com. Find us on Twitter at pffnflpod. And then at pffnflpodcast on the TikTok. Yeah. So let's start with the emails. Okay, so you need to read the first one because it's come in from a man that uses the word y'all. This Um, is the Mountain Time Man one? uh, Well, click on the link. You see, I put links into the document that you don't use properly. Um, um, the Hall of Fame pushback one. Yeah, that's the one. The so one this is Hall we, of Fame we, we went through all these first uh, first year eligible Hall of Fame guys, and we gave a yay or nay, and somebody has given us pushback. So a guy called Brandon Stringer, his email is there. I now need you to read it. It's about guards. It's about one specific guard more than guards. Okay. From Brandon, uh, at least at some point, already. Is- Oh, I like paper to my house. I've already assuming. His- Did you cut this yet? I apparently have lost a, a chunk of his email. Hang tight. Beautiful. Carry it well. What like was the guy's a- name? Brandon something. Hey, while you're waiting, let me tell you about Underdog Fantasy. How's that? We'll get you guys into the top of the show before we talk about it. Oh, no. That. So it, it required there. I didn't. It requires the, uh, the title of the email is the problem. So the title of the email is Jerry is officially a Hall of Famer. Jerry Evans, the New Orleans Saints guard. Then, on you go. Oh, at least at some point. There you go. See? All right. Already assuming Quentin Nelson will make it in, make it in four years. Zach Martin will still is still going, but didn't overlap much. Evan Mathis isn't close. Jari's got as many Pro Bowls as Mathis had years as starter. And yes, Pro Bowls are a fine proxy. Mm. Well, maybe. They're all conference awards without garbage time. The garbage games come at the end of the season with seating essentially locked up. Mankins doesn't have the 09 to 12 peak that Jari had. Jari's got twice the first team all pros. That's four. Twice as many as Yanda, who also should be in but isn't eligible yet. And every four-time All-Pro first-teamer is in, is or slash will be in. Y'all admit Martin will be. They're the only two not in. Should definitely look at the guards that are in. Then y'all will realize there aren't many in either. Despite not being a rotating position and playing every snap, unlike special teams, really don't need the 28th to 30th wide receivers all-time right now in. It's a good question. About that, you know, the guards who play every down versus the flashy wide receivers. There's three of them on the field at any given time, and they can make plays. They're overrepresented receivers. That's what uh, Brandon's saying here. Along with positions like QB, but that's a different discussion. Jari, top nine all time at guard. Ironically, that's where he is on Pro Football References Hall of Fame as well. Third in their AV metric. And he says, yes, metrics outside of PFF count. 
Um, I, I mean, yes, metrics outside of PFF do count. Mm -hmm. However, if you would like to present to me a good offensive line metric, feel free. Because I would say AV from Pro Football Reference is not because it's really just dependent on did you play did you play football and were you on a good offense? Mm. That's how they judge guards. There's more to this email, by the way. But oh, I and Carl Nix had half of Jari's career, literally six for his 12 seasons, and that definitely matters. Jari had as many Pro Bowls as Nix had seasons total. But let's assume all of those mentioned are better and worthy and not true. Uh, there's six guards in the 16 <laughs> PFF years. Should be more since you're definitely projecting with Nelson and Slightly Martin. There's 64 starters a year, meaning, meanwhile, there's Breeze, Brady, Rogers, Manning, Russ, the tail end of Favre, and probably assuming Mahomes since... Nelson is being projected too, and there's only 32 of those spots. What's he trying to say? There's a, as many. If you're if you're being as fair to guards as you're, yeah. Being I mean, so there's a bunch of points in here. Uh, some of whom, some of which are valid, some of which I think are not. He's ranted on guards. Yes, it and is. He basically, a, finishes by saying, "Put some respect on the 2010s All-Decade Team member." Yeah, maybe we should. Uh, we'll get to that. It is a fair point to say that we should be trying to get guards in versus wide receivers where there's already a million and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's a fair point and a reasonable one. That being said, I don't think we're down to, you know, the 30th best wide receivers of all time. I think we're already, like, it's only a couple of years since we were able to get Chris Carter in, who was arguably the second best receiver of all time when he retired. You know what I mean? Like, the standard is still pretty high for receivers, even if the waters have been muddied a bit by some of the guys that have gone in. The big point, though, is like Pro Bowls is a joke. Pro Bowls is a terrible measure of everything. It's a farce. It's ridiculous, and it's gotten worse since it started because now there's a fan vote element, and the whole thing is a mess. So you can't possibly use Pro Bowls as a reasonable measure of whether an offensive lineman deserves to be in or not. Now, there, there was a point, I forget the point I wanted to make where I said I would use Pro Bowls. I don't have it offhand, though. Okay. Go ahead. Good point. Thanks. Well made. Thanks. Um, you are going to be doing a little piece of uh, public service broadcasting about the great Willie propaganda. Anderson. Propaganda. It's propaganda. I, I was, I was going to steer away from that word, but that's okay. Um, oh, no. We're ignoring the bad and focusing on the good. <laughs> so Willie Anderson played at a time where, again, all pros, right? Willie Anderson played at a time where it was just left tackles. People just listed tackles, and you got multiple left tackles because those are the only ones people knew, and right tackle got ignored, even though you could be the best right tackle in the NFL for a decade, and nobody had any freaking idea because all the left tackles just got the all-pro votes. That's where they went, right? Now, those that's been fixed in recent years, but that was certainly an issue at the time. Like, guard, all pros and pro bowls for offensive linemen, the further you go back, the iffier it gets. Now, what's interesting about Evans is... He was drafted in 2006, so we actually have his whole career. And for the first four years, he was on a Zach Martin, Quentin Nelson kind of track. He started off with an 86.5 overall grade, 88.5, 90.2, 92.6. So we're getting better every year from an already insane starting point. And then we fell off a cliff and we went to 75 or 74, 76, 77, 79, 70, 70, 69, 70. Like, the last, what is that, eight years of his career are a completely different level to the first four. Um, and, okay, we, we, you, it's a reasonable point that you give him credit for longevity versus guys like Carl Nix or Evan Mathis or whoever. Uh, but when the level of longevity is at a dramatically lower level than what we first saw or what was evident as his potential ceiling, I think that impacts significantly. So I think it's a reasonable argument to say that... Jerry Evans, Evan Mathis, Carl Nix, Logan Mankins probably all enjoyed a similar peak in terms of 90-plus PFF grades for about four years, that kind of thing. The question is, what do you do with the other years? And in you know, Evan Mathis's case, that's the guy didn't get the opportunity to play much more than that. In Evan's case, it's, well, we got, what, eight more years of a lot less good than that. You know. The, the case for... We're really getting into this. The case for Jari Evans, though, would be similar to the case for Tony Baselli. Tony Baselli was drafted in 1995, the uh, second overall pick that year, right, for the Jacksonville Jaguars, left tackle, and he played from 95 to 01. That's it. He goes 02, he gets signed by the Houston Texans in the expansion draft and doesn't play. So for six years, seven years, 
95 to 01 to Baselli, and he didn't even play in 01, I don't think. And he was ex- he was essentially thought of as like Jonathan Ogden and you know all of the best mm. left tackles. So even if you just like assume if we had grading back there that he was an 88 to 92 like Jerry Evans, it's only like a couple of more years of yeah. elite play, and then it stopped due to injury. Whereas Evans was still an above average player after that. So there's still there's value in having eight years of good after four years of elite. There is. Whereas other elite players, I mean, Kurt Warner's career is basically four or five elite years sprinkled amongst I think I think it's a very difficult stuff. question about what do you do with guys whose peak was amazing but was relatively short and then the rest of their career. And the rest of their career can be completely different things. It can be very short because, you know, injuries or whatever, or it can be much longer but was not anywhere near the same peak. So Carl Nix had a six-year career, but every single season was better than the other years of Jerry Evans' career. You know what I mean? So the first four years of Evans was right up there with anything Nix did, but then every year after that was lower than the worst season we saw from Carl Nix. Evan Mathis has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years of 90-plus PFF grades, but one of those, you know, was 110 snaps, so six years. And one of those, he was splitting reps with, um, who was he splitting reps with? guy's name's falling out of my head the Who Bengals guy the Bengals guy that was splitting reps with with bowling no with uh I'll forget anyway I'll come back to that anyway point is let's call it five and a half years of elite grading like, you know it, I don't know what you do I don't know how you value that correctly five and a half years of elite and then basically nothing versus what well, we get four years of elite but then eight more years of like you know good not great I don't know what the correct weighting for that is. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, offensive line metrics go, I kind of I get accepting all pros, um, although you and I have pushed back a little bit on the who the voters are and the, the idea that before you had any sort of evaluation on the offensive line, it really was who was the guy last year. Yeah. That's how the Pro Bowl voting I, went. If you think... made a reputation for yourself as a guard by year two, yes. you could have been a Pro Bowler from years three through ten, no matter how you played, and an all pro. Um, whether deserved or not. I mean, most of the time it's deserved, but sometimes it's reputation. Yeah. Davin Joseph is a two-time Pro Bowler. I don't think Davin Joseph was necessarily even a starting caliber guard for his entire career, but he was a first-round draft pick, so that just, stayed with him until they cut him. And just to explain Pro Football References AV, it's essentially, did you play, right? Did you play 16 games? That's good. You were on the field. And was your offense good? And Jari Evans playing with the Saints and Drew Brees, right? You had a good offense. Therefore, him... And every guard and tackle that played football while Drew Brees was the quarterback for the Saints probably had a high AV. Yeah. Whereas Nate, whoever played all the, all the snaps for Chad Pennington had a lower AV or whatever it is. Nate Livings was the guard that Nate Evan Masters was splitting time with. Anyway, the other thing I would make, the other point about the All-Pro stuff is that the further back in time you go, the, the sketchier it is in terms of how accurate or not it is. Um, I think there is there's a connection between... PFF showing up and PFF's growth and uh, expansion into the, the zeitgeist of football and how accurate those things are. You know what I mean? Like you go back, you don't have to go back that far between, you know, player X signs. The only thing you're going to hear about him is started 16 games for a team last year. Now people will tell you a little bit about those, you know, people, the knowledge about offensive line has expanded and not from I'm not saying this but offensive linemen have said this like Andrew Whitworth has said you guys have done a ton to increase the you know awareness and the knowledge of of our positions and all that kind of stuff so when you get into the Jerry Evans and the Carl Nix and those guys of that mid-2000s era that's when like PFF existed but our influence was way way lower than it was now and I think there's some there's a disconnect there even though Best Ball Mania has ended, Underdog Fantasy is still the easiest and most fun way to spice up your football season with their Pick'em game. You just look at your favorite or least favorite player stats, pick whether you think they'll end up with a higher or lower total than the number in this week's game, and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy-to-use website and mobile apps. This is a fun game. Pick between two and five players for your Pick'em entry, get all your picks right, and you'll take home some cold hard cash. That's all it is. Just make your picks. It's simple to get started. Just head to underdogfantasy.com or download the app. Sign up with promo code PFF and Underdog will double 
your first deposit up to $100. That's Underdog Fantasy. Promo code is PFF. Get in on the action today. All right, we got another email here. Mm -hmm. This is the Mountain Time one. Yes, this will be a quick one, I believe, from Dustin Mazur, I believe. Do you want Muzzer. to read this one? Mazur is his name. Yeah, I'll read it because there's no y'all. There's no this y'alls. One. You're okay. okay. You're, uh, you're the email reader. Uh huh. Steve and Sam, good morning to you both. It's afternoon here, but we'll, we'll let it slide. Uh, although I come here mainly for Steve's baseball references, I do appreciate your podcast in terms of football knowledge and keeping me awake through my mountain standard time night shifts where absolutely nothing is going on. Good God. That is he be. following? Have we said out loud how much we hate mountain time? <laughs> I can't remember if that's just you and I on the side or if we have brought that to the table for our podcast listeners as well. Is I, he? I don't know. I don't know if he's playing off that, but. I, I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I just. I, I empathize with a man having, it's my, yeah. having to suffer through a mountain time night shift. It's by far the worst time zone. <laughs> yes, uh, unequivocally. That being said, this is him, not me. I think it's safe to say that after two weeks, we have ourselves a case of ginger hot potato at quarterback, with Carson Wentz getting full shot at being the Lone Ranger week one, and now Cooper Rush joining the mix and taking the redheaded spotlight from Wentz. Uh, I'm curious, can the same rule apply to the Watt brothers? Week one, saw TJ dominate the Bengals, and then with JJ sidelined in Arizona. And then week two, JJ comes back and leads the Cardinals to a victory with TJ sidelined in Pittsburgh. Could Derek untap his true Watt potential if both Watts go down? The ginger theory, five, six years later, still yeah. going. It's beautiful. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, you know, who's only been listening for like a recent We always have to time, remind people, yes. The ginger theory was the theory that there's only so much ginger talent in in – I guess, football, the world. And generally speaking, it gets captured by one individual at a given moment. And that that individual plays like superstar and every other ginger plays like crap at the same time. And it was really incredible. Like Carson Palmer had his run and Andy Dalton had his run. And then they never had their runs at the same time and the whole thing. And this year, it's kind of true. Like Carson Wentz had a, had a good week one. Well, certainly based off comeback. his his situational evidence that I'm not going to look beyond, it it tallies. It's perfect. It all adds up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Cooper Rush gets the start in weeks two and three. Washington hasn't won since then, and Cooper Rush is 2-0. Oh, they're about to play, right? Isn't it Washington-Dallas? Oh, I mean, the hot potato. I mean, where's it going to go? Oh, which, guy, which guy gets it? I, well, knowing the way Cooper Rush plays, it's probably going to be like Carson Wentz in the first half, Cooper Rush in the second half. Within the game? Cooper Rush swings, has, has swing, led a game-winning drive in 100% of his career starts. Swings of ginger uh, momentum within the game. It's the best game of the week. Wow. It has to be. So now the question is, are the Watts, can the Watts essentially, yeah, essentially have success if, at the same I, time? I'm particularly intrigued by that last part. If both the – I say both, like there aren't three of them, but if both the real Watts go down, does, does Derek Watt the become real, a superstar? The real Watts. Yeah. If the two that we know the, who are good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I think he does. I'm, I'm in. I think the, I think this is true. Like as TJ has become an all pro, do you think those JJ guys, has been banged up? Yeah. Do you think those guys that are like the third brother, do they just get bummed out through life constantly? You know, do Derek you think Cooper Watt. Manning is uh, bummed out. No, well, they're the the work, he built an Archie. The work that the Mannings are doing right now to get Cooper a late bag in terms of commercial revenue is is outstanding. That Cooper's man's fine. presenting a game show. He's on the Caesars commercials. I saw him interviewing Dana White the other day. Like Omaha yeah. Productions is going to work for Cooper recently. He was, he was too busy using his genes to create Archie. That's true. And then you've got. Uh, but so okay, Cooper Manning he is have the, to take the, kind all of the hits. The forgotten Manning. That's yeah, true. Um, you have Derek Watt. You've got the third uh, the Hem- Hemsworth brother. You got Chris and Luke, who were like the leading men, the superstars are like six foot three, you know, Thor and whatever the hell Liam's done. And then you've got the other guy that's like five nine and doesn't look the same. <laughs> what about the Gronkowski's? It's just right. just Rob. It's just Rob, and then the, the other ones, yeah. yeah, Dan and whoever that Chris, Chris, Dan. But the, Dan and Chris had jobs for a while with with Rob. Had jobs for a while. That's what like they were like. Hey, I'm the fourth string tight end. I'm the backup fullback. Yeah. You know, they had jobs for a while. Most of them also are the same, like, size and shape, you know? Like, they're all, they're all like, physically huge human beings. Chris is less so, right? Chris is the smaller one. I don't know. But, like, Dan Gronkowski is a huge person. So, or so I, I say yes. Derek, Derek Watt is going to become the greatest fullback. He's a fullback, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to become the greatest fullback in the league. It's Would you even children. notice, like, if, if – JJ and, and TJ go down, and Derek Watt becomes the greatest fullback of all time. Would anyone even notice anymore? Well, yeah, because, uh, you know, like Kyle Juszczyk the other night 
working back shoulders along the sideline. Yeah, you would have like, to exceed that. So Derek would have to start, you know, catching back shoulder fades and and all that stuff. Yeah, but he plays for Pittsburgh. They're not giving him those shots. When Kenny Pickett comes in. Oh, okay. Kenny's going to come in. I see. And Kenny Pickett, because we know Mitchell light. can't do this, but Kenny Pickett's going to get the most out of all the talent around him, which includes Derek Watt. All right. I so, see. Thanks, Dustin. Missouri says it at the bottom. It does. It does. Yeah. It says it. You could have, you could have gotten that at the beginning. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. This next one is from Aaron. Ooh, that's tough. Let me ask it because I don't have an answer. Do you have an answer? To the question? Yeah. Well, for, I don't have an answer to what this man's surname is pronounced yet. Lyle? Okay. Let's go with that. Aaron Lyle. All right, it's fine. Let's let's do that. Here's a simple question: What he happened does. to Kenny Galladay? Well, that was my question. His, oh, well, that's true. His, yeah, okay. Simple question: what He went the hell from being a Kenny top Galladay? alpha receiver to the highest paid bench warmer in the league. Is it injury, bad quarterback play, bad scheme fit? And he's just like, yeah, I hope he gets better. Yeah, love the show. Appreciate all your data driven analysis. Kenny Galladay has 22 yards so far this season. He's been paid a lot of money. Yeah. His guaranteed money is something like fourteen and a half million this year. No, seventeen and a half million this year. He's he right now has generated what was it, one hundred and forty thousand dollars for every yard he's gained, which shakes out to about four grand for every inch he's moved the ball forward this season. We're only three weeks in. That's got to get better. Will it? I mean, I said to you during oh, the this game, is Chase Daniel. This is why he was dropping a ball on Monday Night Football. I was like, if you give me a million dollars in like a month to get get you know into shape. I would generate more yardage this season than Kenny Galladay will. Stop. I'm just saying. I can get a schemed up holding the zone play. One. All I need is one. I got more than his 22 yards. Dude. You would not. Well, I mean, it was, yes. I get what you're saying. I said a month to get into shape. We're not talking now, like fresh off the couch. I got to shake so, off those broken hips and stuff. So there's like a – the football sense in me is like, look, what made Kenny Galladay special? He was paired up with Matthew Stafford. Not that that was the thing that made him special, but Galladay has never been a guy who separates great. You know, he he just he's a spectacular catch guy, and you need a quarterback that's going to give you spectacular catch opportunities. And Stafford did give him those opportunities. He threw it up. Galladay went up and made these incredible plays. I'm not saying that was all he did, but that was a big chunk of his game, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not saying Daniel Jones will never give him those opportunities or whatever it might be. But that's like as a starting point. The football sense in me is like, okay, that's, the, that's one of the things. But that should lead to like a little bit of a downturn in production. It shouldn't lead to Kenny Galladay being the number four receiver on a team that needs receivers. That's, that's inexplicable right now, other than injuries and some of the other stuff. But it just to me, it looks like Galladay just has no confidence. Because when he does actually get a pass, he's dropping it or whatever it is. I mean, that, yeah, that's not helping. I don't, so last year his first with the Giants he dealt with a hamstring injury he dealt with rib injury he dealt with a knee injury I think it's a reasonable thing to say that last season we probably never saw a 100% version of Kenny Galladay this season though like when you turn on the tape because obviously you can't you know let's let's watch his catches okay that's not going to take very long so you actually need to watch the routes that he's running and in preseason as well he just doesn't look he doesn't look like an NFL athlete right now. He's like jogging through these routes and stuff. And I don't know if he is jogging through these routes. You know what I mean? It just looks that way from the tape. He doesn't, I mean, he just doesn't look like a wide receiver, an NFL caliber wide receiver athlete right now. He does not look like that human being. And I don't know if that's a result of the injuries he's been dealing with or if that is being done with this. You know, lax of days ago, I'm just like, I got my money. I'm, I'm no longer interested in the outcome of all this. I'm mailing it in out here. I don't know what that is, but when you turn on the tape, this is not a case of a guy where you're like, I mean, he's doing fine. He looks the same as ever. He's just not getting, you know, that's not happening. Like, whatever is happening is a physical thing as well as just being mentally not there. I don't have any evidence to back this up, but, um, which is a great starting yeah, point. Yeah. But doesn't it feel like receiver versus other positions, guys either can lose it quicker. I'm not saying Galladay has. It's not like he's old. They lose it quicker. They hit a wall, right? Like there was a point, like Andre Johnson randomly hit a point in his career where he just wasn't that good anymore. And, and Reggie Wayne hit a point in his career. We just couldn't do much anymore. Like all these guys just hit a point where they can't do anything anymore other than Jerry Rice and yes. Larry Fitzgerald. So they all hit this point. I'm not saying Galladay's there yet, but it's th this position is a little different when it comes to that. Randy Moss 
just mm. at a point just where he just wasn't good anymore. And it's like, is it half a step? Is it just a little bit of explosion? Whereas other position, it doesn't feel other positions, it doesn't feel like there's like a wall that it just hits. There's also receivers like the Travis Fulgham thing a couple of years ago. Yeah. How do you go from so a few years of practice squad and then it's like, okay, this is a great story. Now he's wide receiver one with the Eagles for about six weeks. Mm-hmm. And then he's just practice squad guy again. So why, like, it, it, to me, it feels like receiver goes through these ebbs and flows of performance more than other positions. That's where I don't have the evidence to confirm that. So I would take the same circumstantial evidence slash you know case studies and make a different argument out of them. I think that as much as we talk about what wide receivers can do to an offense, you know, when you add Tyree Kill, what does that do to your offense? It makes the quarterback better, it makes everything around him better, all those kinds of things. I think there is also a real ability these days for offenses and quarterbacks to effectively manufacture wide receivers. So did Travis Fulgham change? Or did he just go through a four week stretch where his team had nobody else and decided, you know what, we're gonna heave the ball to Travis Fulgham for four weeks and see what happens. And if you just start feeding a dude that yeah. amount of targets for four weeks, you can get a run where he ends up with, you know, 300 yards and looks great. Would that happen with Scotty Miller? <laughs> it did, actually. I mean, he did have a, yeah. a stretch. So where he did. you look at Kenny Galladay's career and you, you sort of say, well, what is there there, right? There's two years where he has 1,000 uh, yards. Uh, there's one year where he has um, double-digit touchdowns. There's one year, in fact, where he has more than five touchdowns. And in those years, like 2019, 41 of his 113 targets were contested. That's a lot. 30 of his 115 targets the year before were contested. And he was catching 63, 57% of those contested targets. So I would, I would essentially ask the question of, was Kenny Galladay ever good? Oh, gosh. Or did Matthew Stafford simply, for a two-year stretch, throw the man 127 passes and he caught 65 percent of them the contested ones and all of a sudden we're like oh this guy's insane he's incredible but that essentially is an unsustainable thing or if the quarterback just determines either that quarterback leaves or your quarterback decides you know what i have better options out here i'm going to go somewhere else with the ball you're not actually winning in the ways that wide receivers win so your production drives off a cliff I do think there's a basketball, not baseball, analogy there too, okay. where there are players who are third and fourth options, and when you know the top options go down, they just get fed more, and all of a sudden they're twenty point yeah. game score. They go from ten points to you 20 can to manufacture 22 a degree of over production. a stretch, right? Over a stretch of time. So maybe that's what it is with um, receiver. Like, do you remember Miles Austin had a couple of years where he randomly went crazy? I, just, I thought he was really good, though. I thought he was just really good. But Miles we, Austin was a pretty slick route runner. But it was all like holes in the zone. It was like when Austin Hooper had his crazy year. And you're like, you know what? There's nothing here that happens independent of a space in the zone of a defense. Therefore, Austin Hooper is not actually good. Yeah. And that has been borne out since Austin Hooper has gone to a different offense and he can no longer do that. You know what I mean? I think there is a huge degree to which receiving production for certain players is entirely predicated off simply the quarterback being willing to give him an opportunity to make a play. So what do you do with Galladay going forward? I Our mean, guy Brad Spielberg are talking about a unique contract, a ton of money, difficult to flip. I don't think they can get rid of him trade-wise. I don't know who's going to want that contract. There's also, it's a new regime who's not tied to him. They didn't make the investment. So right. they're not out there trying to justify how much money he's making. They're just like, oh, we didn't pay him. I think they're going to get... So you don't have to like try to squeeze him into the offense right I now. I think they're going to get rid of him at the... the the point where it makes the most financial sense, essentially, as soon as that is humanly possible. No House Advantage is changing the game by offering the most dynamic fantasy sports platform available today. Playing pick'em contests versus other people for the shot at winning 250000 plus in cash. Download the app, choose a contest, select your player props, earn points for correct picks, and climb the leaderboard for your shot at, to win big money every single day. You can also test your skills versus the house and 20 times your entry if you hit all your picks. Bet on up to five player prop over-unders or individual player matchups across every major sports league, including NFL, NBA, MLB, PGA, MMA, and NASCAR. Sign up now with the promo code PFFNFL at nohouseadvantage.com or download the app on the App Store. 
to get a first deposit match up to $25. Make sure to check out No House Advantage today and experience daily fantasy sports redefined because it's not just how you play, but also where you play. You don't want to miss out on this. You think Judge is going to get his 61 homers? He's running out of time. How many more games he got left? Oh, I think five, four or five. Oh, then yeah. Mm -hmm. Yankees schedule. They ended now, August, like first week of October. It's kind of an old school schedule. They, they used to cut it shorter. Yeah, they've got, uh, this is good. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven games, eight uh, games then left. Yeah, They're easy. going until next Wednesday? What is going on here? Easy. Oh, because they started the season late because they had that lockout thing or whatever. Yeah. Uh, He's wanna, pressing, though. Sure. You want the next email? Yeah, let's do it. This one is from Ricardo Zuppelli, who I believe we've mentioned before in the podcast. Hello, sirs. I recall that in the early years of PFF, you used to refer to running back Thomas Jones as an offensive line calibration tool to do his cons uh, due to his consistency at getting exactly what was blocked and no more. Is Kirk Cousins uh, less a quarterback and more of an offensive system or roster calibration tool? Seems like the results suggest yes, especially since he's so considerate to the system as to not provide any of those pesky intangibles with which might muck up the results. Uh, as such, the cutoff, or the Cousins cutoff seems like a decent and alliterative replacement for the Ryan inflection point. Thanks, and keep up the lengthy work. Oh, man. So essentially, is Kirk Cousins the new Matt Ryan inflection point line? We got a lot of preseason pushback from the, uh, the Cousins people. There's a lot of Cousins people. The cousins people? Yeah, there's a lot of Cousins people. Um, he's graded pretty well for us. Yes. The last couple of years. I think, so I think that's where I've, I don't think he's the new Matt Ryan inflection point. You don't? No. I felt better. People forget how good Matt Ryan was. Yeah? Matt Ryan was really good. Uh-huh. He was really, really good. I think, I think Matt Ryan's best is better than Kirk Cousins' best. Yeah, but that wasn't the point of the Matt Ryan inflection point. Like, if you could get MVP Matt Ryan, obviously that's better than the Matt Ryan inflection point. The no, point was Matt the sort of baseline of where he is is right in that zone where... Matt Ryan was QB8, right? Yeah. Is what we kept saying. Uh -huh. He's QB8. You know where Kirk Cousins ranks right now? The season eighth, yeah, that's... It's ninth, actually, but... Yeah, but, yeah, I get it. And he was a little bit higher last year. I don't think when you're saying we're starting a franchise right now, I don't know if Cousins makes it into the top eight. Does he? All right, well, how many... Uh, name them. So starting a franchise would theoretically take out Brady and Rodgers, but let's say you're yes. starting a one-year franchise, right? So you're not one, talking. Okay. Well, so you're you, talking about winning this year. Yeah. So you. Want so you've got Josh Allen, Josh Allen, Mahomes, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Lamar. Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, it's five. Herbert, uh, Herbert, Joe Burrow. Burrow, and who am I missing here? <laughs> See, kind of run out. No, you're not running out. Well, who's your eighth? Because this is it. This is your number. Sorry, my, my stats you got one more. Out. Otherwise, Kirk's your guy. Stafford. Stafford over Kirk. Yes. Okay. Even though, like, you rewind a year, you probably don't say that. And then probably Russell Wilson still. Russ. Yeah. To present day Russ over Kirk Cousins. The evidence is mounting against that. Yes. But I would say Russell Wilson has a better track record that I would that you would that you would pay for. Wow. Above him. And then at the very minimum, Kyler though, Murray. At the very so. minimum, I think we can. I think that exercise illustrates he's pretty close to that line. And Dak, don't forget Dak. Dak. I would take Dak over Cousins. I mean, Dak and Cousins, and are I would take Kyler. Anyway, the point being, he is pretty much where that line should be. He's close. I think Dak might be the the better calibre, the better Matt Ryan inflection point. Dak might be the better Matt Ryan. Okay. No, I know. Like all the bike, the Dak was terrible against the Bucks. And Cooper Rush is two and zero since then. And there's controversy in Dallas and the whole thing. I get it. I mean, I think Dak and Cousins are both good proxies for this idea of you are affected. They they're they're good players to term like offensive system calibration tools. Like Dak, I think, is the most susceptible quarterback in the league to changes in his quarterback environment which is exactly what that is and cousins i think because of his limitations is a similar type of player so i actually think they're very good examples of that they're better than the you know i think the problem with the running back the thomas jones thing being an offensive line calibration tool is that a an offensive line calibration tool at running back is not a good player at all 
he will get, you know, he's a very average type of player. Whereas I think a quarterback calibration tool requires a level of play that's a bit higher than that. Otherwise, you're getting nothing. Yeah, we're describing two different things. We use the Matt Ryan inflection point as like, this is the bottom of the top two tiers of quarterbacks that you can you know, just increase your chances of winning. Not that, you, not that a Nick Foles can never go on a run or a Flacco could never go on a run, but this was like the bottom of the top tiers, mm -hmm. right? Whereas Thomas Jones, you were basically saying, this is your 3.5 yards per carry guy. And that will become four with a great offensive line, and it'll become three point two with a bad offensive line, right? That's a different. We were just we always joke that Thomas Jones was like dead smack average quarterback. His proxy is probably closer to like Andy Dalton six or seven years ago when Andy Dalton was like he's QB fifteen. Yeah. Some years he'll be ten, some years he'll be twenty, but he is QB fifteen, right? Who's that guy now? Who's QB fifteen? Hmm. By the yeah. way, Tannehill's probably right in the mix with Kirk Cousins. Ooh, I don't know about that. You don't think so? I was about to suggest Tannehill for the QB15 guy. He might be QB15. Is it Jameis? Wentz? I don't even think Jameis is that high. Anyway, do um, you want to get into our, uh, our next segment? Yeah, what's our next it's segment? It's your favorite. It's Explain the Grade. All right, let's People like this. People like this. We're going to keep it going. Every week on Wednesday's show, we are going to explain a PFF grade from the week previously that doesn't necessarily jive with what people thought happened or what people expect or, or those kinds of things. So last week we did two. I actually like the idea of doing two each week, and I'm going to stick with that this time until somebody tells me different. So first grade, uh, Joshua Allen, Buffalo Bills superstar, carried the team on his back, uh, put up a ton of yards. How many yards did he put up? Hit 400 passing yards. 400 Four passing yards. Yeah, there we go. Put up 400 passing yards, had two touchdowns, uh, but he had a PFF grade of 53.8. Why, Steve? Well, for Josh Allen, it's pretty easy. It was all the turnover-worthy plays. It was all how, the plays. How many? Six. Yeah. Um, three fumbles in there, right? Was it three fumbles or two? But Because um, there was one that we were trying to figure out how bad is it. Mm. Like when we were going through the grading, because there's one, there's like a, it's a zero blitz and Allen, his left tackle gets absolutely whooped, but Allen starts drifting toward the left tackle to try to create some space. But he actually made the pressure allowed by the tackle look even worse because he drifted into it and fumbles, um, had another fumble in there. So I don't remember if they lost him or not, because again, when I'm looking at player evaluation, I know Allen didn't recover him, um, when I'm looking at player evaluation, I'm not saying, well, he, well, Bill's got it back, therefore it's not bad, right? We're saying the fumble is the fumble. Um, we also have, he also, I mean, you straight up missed the final throw. That's a, yeah. that's a downgrade. But the big downgrades that I'm talking about here, the turnover-worthy plays, dropped pass in the end zone by Xavier Howard. That should have been a game, pretty much a game-ending interception. Yet another drop by Javon Holland. Um, so there are just multiple plays that were thrown into coverage that did not. There was a get picked off. he took a shot at a it was like a cover two hole shot, but ended up being so lofted that it was essentially into triple coverage. Like right. the safety, the corner, and the slot, whoever that was, the slot corner, all converged on this throw. One of them should have picked it off. So that was six total turnover worthy plays. Yes. Had a few big time throws in there. He did well. Um, I would say the other thing when you look at the box score. There is a difference. Like when you say a guy threw 400 yards, um, there's a difference throwing 400 yards on 63 attempts versus, say, 40 attempts, obviously. So that's part of the reason why he threw for 400 yards. Yard, yardage totals in a vacuum don't really tell you anything. Even if you were using yards per attempt as a proxy, he was at 6.3. That's a below average number. So even if you were just using a stat to say, is this 400 yards impressive? Well, not really on 63 attempts. That's a below average number. So you can't say, well, he had 400 yards. Now, if you want to go back and say it was all him, it was like the Josh Allen show. He did lead the team in f with 47 rushing yards. And, of course, he dropped back a million times. That's context, right? To me, that's more context. And I would say the guy graded at 55 or whatever it was, 53, in a game in which the Bills put everything on his plate. And... I think that's a simple explanation. The yeah. turn of worthy and, plays. And he gets credit for four big time throws in that game. So this was one of the most um wild game wild performances you're gonna see in terms of a ton of big time throws and a ton of turnover worthy plays as well. It was right there with that Mac Jones game this week right. of 
there was a lot of good in there, but there was also a lot of bad. It's yeah, and it's we get sick. a lot of questions about turnover worthy. So the the Patrick Mahomes last interception, um, someone almost immediately after that happened sent us a message. Hey, is that turnover worthy? Hmm. Um, so the last interception, it's the last play of the game. He throws a slant. I think it was on, was it on fourth down, third down, whatever it was. Throws a slant. It gets tipped. Twice, and then, right? Um, that, that, maybe a couple times, and then eventually intercepted. That was not turnover worthy because you throw the slant. It's just a regular pass breakup. That thing falls to the ground literally 97, 98% of the time. Yeah. Right? So that's what we're judging it. Did you throw a pass that was – now, if he threw it behind the receiver right. at the defensive back, we'd say, yeah, that's turnover worthy. You threw it at him. Right? So there are levels to these things, but we also just look at like a batted pass – falls to the ground the majority of the time just because it becomes an interception not turnover worthy in our sense the Mahomes one same thing so the turnover worthy plays will get a much lower grade in our system so on the flip side we have a quarterback who put up you know reasonable numbers but who had a PFF grade of 92.5 this week and that is Brown's new starting quarterback due to suspension Jacoby Brissett so Jacoby Brissett went 21 of 31 for 220 yards, two touchdowns, and zero interceptions, but had a PFF grade of 92.5. Why? So a couple reasons here with Brissett. First off, he played a really good game. I mean, this wasn't yeah. like – so the difference in this versus the Allen game, when you're watching Josh Allen, there's enough good plays in there where you're like, man, this dude's like – he's balling out, he's doing these things, and it's easy to kind of ignore the, the bad ones. With Brissett, you were watching this game against the Steelers being like, he's played a really good game. Now, you probably didn't come out of that thinking, it's a 92. That's well, like that's a very good game. I do think there's definitely a group of people that are sort of saying, hey, this Jaco- how does Jacoby Brissett get a 90 grade who didn't watch Jacoby play in that game? You know what I mean? Because oh, yeah. Jacoby Brissett played very well in that game. And even if you didn't have you know, the grade, if you, even if you weren't writing anything down, even if you just watched the game, you'd come away impressed with how Jacoby Brissett played on Thursday night. Um, what do you, do you have the where's the stat line again? 21 of 31 for 220 yards, two touchdowns, and a, and no picks. So let me I, I want to talk differently about this one because to me this was Jacoby Brissett threw 10 incompletions, and if you watched this game against the Jets in Week Two, um, he was not making any mistakes until he made a terrible mistake at the end of the game. <laughs> Brissett was not missing throws. So I think what happens with quarterback stats versus the grades not every incompletion is on the quarterback Mm -hmm. and it's not just drops right so of those 10 incompletions we have a couple drops those are pretty those are easy to explain we also have one that we didn't necessarily call a drop but we call because we have different types of incompletions amari cooper it was fourth and two he's wide open jacoby hits him kind of loses it on the way to the ground doesn't necessarily go to the drop total but it's essentially a drop right so jacoby's incompletions were a combination of a couple drops couple times when he got hit while throwing, a miscommunication in there, which we don't necessarily, you know, dock anybody, a couple pass breakups, that's better, that's good defense more than bad offense, and one where Amari ran out of bounds. Yeah, that's right. And I know you you saw this one. And and again, he only threw for 220 yards, but these things start to add up. It's essentially like a 25 for 31. Like if you just gave him a couple of these completions that he earned. All of a sudden, he's like 25 for 31 for 300, and the stat line matches the 92 grade a lot better. That one play, I think, is an important one because that play, because of the because of Amari Cooper running out of bounds, you know how that's recorded in the in like the game book, the stat line goes down as an incompletion, even though it landed in his hands. The receiver caught it and he ran for 50 yards, right? right. It, it, because he stepped out of bounds, it doesn't even get nullified. It actually counts as an incomplete pass on the play and a loss of down. So if you give him that play, and this is a play, it wasn't just, hey, wide the hell open Amari Cooper, a pass, whatever. Jacoby Brissett escapes pressure in the pocket, rolls out to the right, waits for Cooper to get open, hits him with a pass. And at the point he attempted the pass, Cooper hadn't stepped out of bounds yet, right? So at the point where where Brissett's part of the play is finished, he has loosed the ball to an open receiver who's about to get a big gain off the back of it, having manufactured that uh, play himself by getting out of a cluttered pocket and finding space to make that happen. So this is a play where Brissett absolutely should get real credit for it. The play went for, I think, 50 yards, 53, something like that. If you give him that catch back and say, you know, what happened after that with Cooper running out of bounds is not his fault, so let's count that as a play, um, it gives him 278 yards instead of 
220 yards. It gives him a passer rating of 120 instead of 109. You know, and, and all of a sudden we're feeling a lot better immediately about yeah. 91 versus that kind of box score performance. So that, I think, is a really good example of how, like, one play through something completely independent of you can very well alter, like, the difference in the, the box score numbers versus the grade. Yeah, that's, I, I like to use the stats just to paint the picture because I, I push back on that a lot of times. I say, don't look at the stats. They paint a picture that, does, that isn't always there. But I like to say, all right, if you're going to use the stats as a baseline because they speak to you, give them these three yeah, plays. And, and give them these three plays. Give them or take away these three plays that they earned, and then see what the stats yeah, look. And like. I'm not saying that like that it, that one play itself is why Brissett earned a 90, right? Because there was yards after the catch on that play as well. It's not like sure. it was this, you know it wasn't an incredible sort of 55 yard bomb that was into tight double coverage or whatever. It was it was a nice play by Jacoby Brissett. But it, with the point being. It affected his box score a lot, and it was one of a number of plays in this game that didn't go his way when they should have. And, and when you look at the grading, like he got downgraded like once in that game or something. He basically didn't make a mistake. Second straight week, he just was not making a mistake. So this and was unlike the, game, the last one, he yeah. didn't then go and torpedo yeah. it with one like, uh, like head slapping mistake late on. Jacoby also did a really good job. Uh, moving the chains with QB sneaks and things that affected his rushing grade. So that all helped out as well. So um, again, I think I think having a one number grade is great and all, but there's a lot of ways that you can get there, right? 90s, sometimes 90s are because you guys get a t ha just have a ton of big time throws. Um, and But other times it's they just don't miss a whole lot. They're not the reason for incompletions or bad plays. And that's kind of been Jacoby's good grades the last two weeks. He's just not missing a whole lot. He is not overthrowing, underthrowing, throwing uncatchable passes to his receivers. By the way, if you gave him that um, that extra pass we're talking about, um, he would have ended up with a much better yards per attempt figure. He would have been right under nine. So he would go from 7.1. Yeah. And the stats, the stats would have matched up yeah. perfectly. So and it's, it's just another way that that box score would have – like if, again, if you give him that box score instead of the one he actually ended up with, I, there wouldn't be that many people arguing. Well, that doesn't feel like a ninety grade. And I just want to say, like, I think the grades—they're not perfect as far as separating from your supporting cast, but I think they're better than even the most advanced metrics like EPA, which I always try to reference. Is is more of a a team-driven stat, right? When your quarterback throws a jump ball and your receiver mosses him for the play, you get all the EPA and you get all, and, and that goes into your QBR by ESPN. ESPN focuses on EPA and air yards. So when your receiver does the work 50 yards down the field to win on a jump ball, your quarterback stat is directly affected by what the receiver does. And we try to do our best to parse that out. Not yeah. perfect, but we do our best. Like a jump ball is a good example where we do a good job of saying, that's a jump ball. That's going to fall incomplete 80% of the time. We're going to give you zero credit for that. We're going to say that's a neutral score by the quarterback. And if it becomes a completion or doesn't become a completion, it doesn't change the quarterback uh, results there. Yeah, it's impossible to separate the quarterback from everything else around him. That's why we spend so much time talking about the impact of receivers, the impact of coaches, all this kind of stuff. Right. We attempt to do that. You can't ever separate them out. But, it, but the attempt is what... And, you know, we get criticism because of the subjectivity. Well, you're just attempting to do it by this crazy subjective, you know, which way is the wind blowing way of grading. And this, there's structure to it, but the attempt to separate that out is what makes PFF grading more predictive than other measures out there. Like, it's why it's been shown by other people, not by us, um, to have a greater predictability or predictive power than using EPA or using and whatever other metric you like. It's because that attempt to separate out the quarterback from other things, even if you can't get it, get all the way there, even if you can't even get most of the way there, like just, just taking a swing at that thing is important. So there you go. It's our Explain the Grade uh, session every Segment. Wednesday. Yeah. Sound good? Explained. Done. Completely explained. Mm -hmm. I'm sure nobody's going to. If you liked that explanation, hit the thumbs up button in the uh, yes. YouTube. If you, even if you didn't like if you think we're idiots, yeah. you can still give us a thumbs, thumbs up. up anyway. Yeah. Um, and remember, look, if, if there's a particular grade you want to see every week, then hit us up. Message us on Twitter or send us an email, nflpodcast.pff.com. We are eager to explain the ones that people want to hear the most about. So there you go. Let's go to uh, 
Is that it for our, our, our part of the show here? Yeah, now I think we're, uh, we're straight into to Mike. All right, let's preview a little uh, Bengals Dolphins. All right, very pleased to welcome in Mike Ryan Ruiz, uh, EP, executive producer, right, of the Lebetard Show, executive producer at Meadowlark, all kinds of, and all things Miami correspondent. Yeah, yeah, all things <laughs> Meadowlark is probably a good way. I know I have a pretty ambiguous title, so that's a, he laid it out, Those part of the Lebetard the Show and, and doing some stuff with Meadowlark. Uh, big fans of, of you guys and, and your site. Um, always fun to have you guys on the show, so when I got the offer, I couldn't help but reciprocate. Thank you so much. Very honored to be here. Very happy to have you. The first thing I want to start with, this is one that Steve wants no part of, but you're a Chelsea fan, you know, for the, the Premier League, the, the people that listen. I'm a Liverpool fan. So I'm curious, in your opinion, which one of us is more screwed this season? We're both pretty screwed. <laughs> um, at least with Chelsea, they have a history, even with a new owner, of being able to realize, oh, this is not going well. Uh, we should change everything, and maybe that'll that'll give it the 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 spark that they need. It's interesting with with Liverpool because you let go of Mane, but I actually thought that that was a right move. If, mm. if you're looking to get rid of a player at a, at a, a stage in their career, I know he's been playing very well. Um, time will tell. I, I think Liverpool ends up making the top four. I can't say the same for Chelsea right now. It's a bit of a transitional year for them. Thankfully. They've been as aggressive with younger players like U18s, U20s in their signing strategy. So hopefully, hopefully there's a good foundation being built over here. But I'm not too bullish on Chelsea right now. It is the great thing about Chelsea, though, that you're only ever six to nine months away from a total reset, which can change yeah. everything. Um, yeah. Like the Marlins. Well, I, I'm, like the Marlins I'm and a the little Fires. disappointed that uh, Bowley handed Tuchel the reins to the transfer strategy. If this was always the plan, I'm not really sure why we're – looking for players that fit his style if the plan was to get somebody in there that you jibed with a little bit better but onward and upward chaos and trophies that's the, the motto around chelsea so it, it, we got the chaos right now trophies tend to follow is that what you were hoping for sam yeah well there answer. you go yeah. that's that's it well, that's all the the, the soccer sto- story it's a good, we can it's move a good on. icebreaker to talk soccer let's get to the dolphins there they're three and oh um yeah first time since what 2018 they were 2018, right? but if you look at 2018, it was pretty fraudulent. They, they've yes. beaten some impressive teams this that, year. That, that's my question, right? Because teams have been 3-0. The Panthers were 3-0 and last year, right? The Giants were just 2-0 and going into Monday. Is this a legit 3-0? and Are the Dolphins for real? And what's it like down there as far as the buzz go with the Dolphins? Well, a lot of a lot of dormant social media accounts are, are <laughs> once again uh, at, the, at the peak of their game right now. I saw there was a, a Twitter account, a Hard Rock Stadium Sun has opened up account. Uh, the Hard Rock Stadium Sun is having their victory tour. We had Stefan Diggs, coincidentally, on our show yesterday, and he said it's the most exhausted after a game he's ever been. You have Bill's Mafia complaining on Twitter about OSHA violations because of <laughs> the Sun. That's perfect. Um, That's great. Which uh, I was actually happy that there was a national spotlight on what I've been saying every time I leave my house for work. God damn, it's hot. That temperature so. was crazy. Look, I mean, you live in Miami, right? So you're used to that kind of heat. But as an Irishman displaced to a foreign country, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is cruel and unusual punishment. It with should not humidity. be permitted without, you know, air conditioning. I've, I've lived here all my life. It's getting hotter. It, it's irrefutably getting hotter. I know I'm getting older, maybe not as good at, at running with these things, but as a, a, as a Canes booster, I'm at that stadium a lot for tailgates, and it's pretty inhumane uh, to be playing a, a sport out there right now. But to answer your original question, um, while I'm not a Dolphins fan, I, I'm rooting for several people in that organization. I, I've had the privilege of meeting the head coach. I'm rooting for him. Um, there's a good energy around town about this team. It's been so long that I barely even remember what this town was like when the Dolphins were really cooking. And right now, this seems sustainable. You, you mentioned 2018. They had that one Chad Pennington year where they totally took advantage of the, the Tom Brady injury and, and ran with it. This seems like the seeds of something sustainable. So I think that the excitement level here for the Miami Dolphins is at a level that I haven't seen quite honestly since I'm not going to say Marino because that's cliche but since the the Fiedler, Jason Taylor Zach Thomas um, end of Jimmy Johnson start of Wonsat tenure with Ricky Williams I I think that they think that they're 
in the game now, and they may be in the game for quite some time. But that, like, the Marino threshold is the really interesting one because even when Miami was a pretty good team and they had a good defense and Jay Fiedler was the quarterback, they were good. But there's always that feeling of, hey, we have a Jay Fiedler team going up against, you know, real quarterbacks. Whereas all of a sudden, if Tua, you know, continues to play like he is, even if it's a product of Tyreek Hill and Mike McDaniel and everything else, it's a different feeling. You know, that they're potentially real contenders versus just sort of everybody feel, waiting to get found out a little bit against the best teams. Yeah, yeah I think in many ways, Dan Marino was obviously a great thing to happen to the franchise, but maybe a bad thing to happen to the fan base because it, it, it set a bar um, that even the Miami Heat had trouble meeting. I think I can safely say, like, Dwayne Wade is maybe at that Marino level, but it, it's it's basically this town's Michael Jordan, and every quarterback that has ever walked through the door down here is directly compared to Dan Marino. And you guys know from being in, in, in football media what a cult of personality Tua has become when they're cooking, when they're winning games because he's making plays down the stretch, especially displaying a big arm. You're getting generations of people making that comparison, and they're finally buying in. They've had good teams, but for the fan base to really feel like they have a shot, they need the quarterback to be the face of it. They need to believe in the quarterback, and there's always been spirited debates surrounding Tua, but now you're starting to have consensus buy-in on him. It still may be too soon, but uh, the fan base has seen enough, I think, to make a judgment call. Yeah, it's such a fascinating thing because quarterbacks get all the credit, all the blame, but of course you need to have a supporting cast. And the supporting cast that Miami has built, outside of the offensive line, which is coming together, they've made some investment there, and it's certainly better there. But the idea of having a Jalen Waddle with incredible speed, you add Tyree Kill to the mix, and then you add Mike McDaniel, who you mentioned a little bit too. It felt like McDaniel just burst onto the scene in the middle of last year. Like the 49ers said, hey, go do press conferences all of a sudden. And before you know it, the guy's got a quote that's going viral every single week. What? What have you? What do you make of Mike McDaniel so far, and what he's been bringing to the table in this turnaround? It's actually interesting. I've always liked Mike McDaniel, dating back to when I was a Browns fan, and he had to come to the sideline and, and act with Johnny Manziel on a on a gadget <laughs> play. I'm a I'm a huge fan of Kyle Shanahan, dating back to Mike Shanahan. I think that that offense has just had proven results. So anybody that comes out of that system, I'm always kind of kind of bullish on the reaction to Mike McDaniel. I, I'd say nationally and even locally. I'm not even sure he's that big of a fan uh, of it because, let's say, for day one of of camp, he, the media asked him to take a selfie. You know, this is still very much a leader of men. You're not going to be asking Brian Flores to take a selfie with the group. Right. I think he's quirky when compared to other folks, but people tend to view that as a shot at one's leadership, and I think he has buy-in, and he talks to people like they're um, adults, but he expects results, and I was always super high on the guy. It's funny, when the Brady-Sean Payton thing happened, I had the, the hot take at the time that missing out on those guys isn't necessarily the worst thing because I believed in Mike McDaniel so much. This is not me having a victory parade because I still think it's very early in the process. Uh, the one thing that has shocked me so far in the Mike McDaniel experience is I, I thought you could hang your hat on the running game being better than it was last year when they had guys like Gaskin and, and Ahmed back there. And... I mean, Gaskin, I think, is not getting any play now. He's fourth on the depth chart right now, and still the running game hasn't gotten going. That's not how Mike McDaniel wants to be winning games, yet he is still winning them. It's a sign of a good team when they're pulling victories out and they're doing it in unexpected ways when the running game of a Kyle Shanahan protege hasn't really gotten fully online yet. Um, I, I think there's plenty of reason for hope, and the Dolphins are looking to me like an almost certain playoff team. I always think of, you know, when you're trying to decide credit or blame, I think of it as a sort of pie chart, you know, and how much of a portion of the pie does each person deserve in terms of credit or blame. So for this Miami turnaround, where, how much of a, of a piece of the pie do you think belongs to Tua actually being a better quarterback once you give him players to throw to and an offensive line that can survive on its own for more than a second? How much is Mike McDaniel and how much of it is bringing in just like an absolute freak superstar like Tyree Kill, who is you know a unique athlete in the NFL. Well, I, I think let's start at the top. Let's give Stephen Ross some credit, but not in the way that you would think conventionally. 
he wanted to win so bad <laughs> that he botched this situation so so poorly that now they have a, a, a head coach that is certainly going to support him way more than than Flores ever did. And I think that's part of the problem. You had a quarterback that was certainly lacking confidence. And if you look at the list of play callers, if you could even identify who was calling the plays over the last few years, this was not necessarily a situation where you can make a fair evaluation, which got us so tired of the Tua conversation to begin with, because the rational wait-and-see approach doesn't make sense in today's day and age. But the Dolphins, a lot like the Philadelphia Eagles, decided to load the the offensive side of the ball up with talent, have a more aggressively offensive-minded head coach, so you can make a fair evaluation and reserve some of your draft capital for the following year should you move the same way that Philadelphia did. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, Stephen Ross got hit with a tampering charge, so the draft capital for next year is all gone. And thankfully for the Dolphins, the Tua project so far uh, in being able to get a fair representative data point is working out, uh, I think. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm not – if they lose, if they get boat race on Thursday, I wouldn't necessarily – read too much into that and we can get into the matchups a little bit later for a very good Thursday night game but I think because they miss out on Peyton because they miss out on Brady they might have found something a little bit more sustainable here with with Tua and Mike McDaniel well let's get into Thursday night let's do it because uh, it's our hometown it's not our team or anything like that but it's our hometown Cincinnati Bengals and uh the buzz was incredible here in town just a few months back. The whole city was lit up, orange and all that stuff. And we got Joe Burrow. We have our guy. But the Bengals start 0-2. They're, they beat the Jets. They're 1-2 now. So not as much excitement as you have in Miami at the moment. But the Bengals still believe they have their guy. But Joe Burrow still taking sacks at a ridiculous rate. So now you have Miami, who loves to blitz and has a good group of pass rushers. You know, adding guys like Trey Flowers and Melvin Ingram uh, basically for nothing. We talked about that on Monday. It was just a great, great additions by the Dolphins. What are your thoughts on this Dolphins defense, their pass rush, and what that is going to do against this Bengals offensive line that's still trying to figure it out? Well, to give Mike McDaniel a bit more credit was he walked into that room and he could have just demanded a sweeping change on the defense and something that was in line with his philosophy, but the defense was pretty solid last year, especially down down the stretch. He decided to keep some continuity there uh, with the defensive coordinator. They're running a very similar system that they had success in uh, last year. Uh, I think um, I think the world of Javon Holland, I think Xavier Howard is a player that might have his name um, honored in the ring of honor for the Miami Dolphins. A lot of what they do and how aggressive they blitz is a, a testament to guys like Holland and, and Xavier Howard because they trust them to be on an island and, and make plays. We saw that kind of caught up with them maybe in the first half against Baltimore, but overall those players are absolutely flashing. As far as what it means for Thursday night, uh, you guys know that Joe Burrow has been struggling against cover two. Dolphins run man and, and zero and, and three just about more than anybody else in the league right now. So Joe Burrow is going to have a bit of a break from the looks that have been giving him a little bit trouble. But Miami's still going to be very aggressive trying to get to the quarterback. Both of these offenses aren't nearly as efficient when under pressure. So... I actually think that this is a good get-right matchup defense, uh, that that Joe Burrow has in front of him. It's kind of like now or never. This is actually a huge game for the Cincinnati Bengals. Entering the season, I wasn't as high on the Bengals because if you look at what happened last year, it got a lot of breaks. A lot of breaks. They And think about if Aaron Donald gets to the quarterback just a split second later, they might have just straight up stolen a Super Bowl championship when you can make the arguments that – they probably shouldn't have gotten out of that Raiders game. Certainly should have had no business winning that Tennessee game. And the, the Chiefs approached their lead in that AFC Championship game with an arrogance that was almost unparalleled. So I just don't think they're as good as your typical young AFC champion would be. That's not to say that they're not going to build back. I am surprised that Mike Brown actually decided to invest, invest in the offensive line, and yet it is no way better than it was last year. And now is that starting to catch up to Joe Burrow? You guys are the experts. You tell me. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think this is an interesting matchup because of the way that Miami plays coverage is a little bit different everything they've been seeing. So they've been seeing teams that can get pressure, that can cause Burrow problems, but unlike last year, he can't really just sort of heave and hope to Jamar Chase. 
because teams are playing the kind of coverages that dissuade that. The Dolphins don't, but they blitz the hell out of him. So it, it is this fascinating dynamic of, you know, on the one side, you're probably going to see some looks in the secondary that you quite like this weekend. The downside is what happened last week to Josh Allen, which is you're not going to have time to, you know, sit there, survey it, and decide you like that matchup. You're going to be put under pressure and, you know, have – heavy blitz is coming your way early and often, and you're going to have to make those calls quickly, which is not something Burrow typically loves doing. Right, but to your point, he still has a lot of weapons out there, but if you look yeah. at the injury report for both teams, this is a low-key mash units for both, but it's the ones that they play through. So I'm not really sure. I, I think for the Cincinnati Bengals, this game is coming at a right time. That was a hugely emotional win for... Miami, short turnaround. They lose uh, time on the travel. Uh, it, as as we highlighted, the matchup, at least in the secondary, is good for Joe Burrow. They absolutely need this one. I think you can basically write off the Bengals if they lose this one and drop to, yeah. to one and three. Prime time. They got the uniforms that everybody's excited about. Uh, I A think uh, I'm Except really Burrow. into this Thursday night game. I think they've gotten really lucky with the Thursday night matchup so far. They've all been kind of interesting and captivating. And for Cincinnati in particular, there is so much on the line here. If Miami strolls into the defending AFC champion and, and ends up losing a game that that defending AFC champion absolutely has to have with what we assume is a proven commodity, I don't really think you can hold that against them too much. If they go in there and win... I, considering the circumstances that we just outlined right now, then you're legitimately, even though some folks locally are entertaining it after last week's win, you're legitimately talking about division and hosting a playoff game and the Buffalo Bills path in which they're this astronomical favorite to win the um, the AFC. Now all of a sudden is a path that goes through the road. It's huge implications for the AFC on Thursday night, I think. Well, we're already that the Dolphins are already hosting playoff games here. We have gotten ahead of ourselves. I mean, I think it's a good it's a good point that there's not much to lose from Miami's perspective in terms of if they drop this game, you know, given how much Cincinnati needs it, there's no shame in that from a Miami standpoint, but there's a lot to gain, as he points I mean, out. If you win this game, like that's a major statement off is. the back of the previous three. It is. That's the tough part, right? We talked you talked about how physically demanding that game was on Sunday and like you felt it. I mean, it felt like a heavyweight battle, which usually happens like in the snow in December, but it, you could feel the heat. Like you could feel it. The crowd also sounded like the loudest I've ever heard. The heat didn't affect the fans, apparently. No, no, no <laughs> that, that place actually does have an atmosphere when you have a good team behind it. Uh, I know that uh, it's kind of gotten viral for the University of Miami uh, lately and their, their lack of that. crowds. But I will tell you, in 2017, when they hosted Notre Dame, I had people that worked at ESPN and College Game Day say that's the second loudest stadium they've ever heard in their entire life because of how it's designed, how it keeps yeah. the sound in there, and how it's definitely designed for the uh, the away team to be punished yeah. by by the elements over there but that was a lot of plays that Miami's defense was out there for 90 uh in yeah. approximately in that in that neighborhood can they get the same kind of push will their pass rushers have the, their legs underneath them will guys like Xavier and Howard still have enough juice in in, in their lower bodies to keep up with this stellar skill uh, skill weaponry that Joe Burrow has at his disposal in, in guys like Higgins and, and Chase and, and, and Boyd. I just think it's a it's a bridge too far to to expect Miami to win this, certainly they're, as they're an underdog. If they overcome all of that, and you have to take a treetop view on what their season's been so far, then I, I don't think it's a ridiculous conversation to have that, say, AFC East is certainly in play. And the schedule actually lays out quite nicely for Miami. Um, after having a very difficult start to it. So we want to get a pick from all of our Thursday or Wednesday guests, um, and we'll get that in a second. But first, I just want to ask, are you intentionally disrespecting our guests wearing a Florida Gators top? This yeah. is a... This is a Miami Hurricanes man, and you're oh, sitting is there. That, is that what he's Little doing? Gators. I couldn't even. I Little couldn't Gators. even tell because the screen was small. Look, it's yeah. it's we're we're having rough weeks. Steve and I, too, yeah, because right now FSU Twitter isn't shy about leaning into their banter advantage that they certainly have right now. Um, ironically enough, talking not about preach, them uh, preaching patience just, uh, you know. when uh, they lost to Jacksonville State last year. But we'll, uh, it's, a, it's like that line in, in Batman, why do we fall? 
So I'm just, you know, pick we're, ourselves we're, up. We're here trying to get good guests on. We're trying to be nice to them, and you're sitting there wearing. Look, I I make my decisions because it's not 100 degrees here. It's it feels like fall out there, <laughs> it's and this is my day. best fall pullover. So the, here I am, my best. This second up to Collinsworth right too. This is this yeah, is the, and, you know the boss. That's true. Yeah, this is the first day that I've had to wear not shorts to work for months. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's starting to feel today. like fall up here. So all right, Mike. So the Dolphins are a four point underdog going into the the cauldron that is. Uh, Paul Bryant Stadium, right? Yeah. 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 Whatever. <laughs> Paycor? How Paycor do you think Stadium. that's... Paycor State? They renamed yeah, that? Yeah, Paycor. Oh, that was this year, right? Yeah, Paycor. Yeah, okay. Get it it's right. always the jungle. Yeah, into... You hedge all your bets. You just call it the jungle. Into and, yeah. new corporate brand stadium. Um, uh-huh. where, how do you think it's going to go? What's your pick? I, I'd be really surprised if Miami wins this game outright because of all the the very logical reasons why they would lose this game. Sure. Um, and, and for me, it's a matchup, and it's a spot that the, the Bengals absolutely have to have. I think the emotion, the plays that they all ran, the heat from Sunday, all of it catches up to Miami. I don't think there's shame in it. Um, it'd be a valiant effort. But without the running game fully online to lean on, I don't see Miami having enough juice on both sides of the ball to keep up with a primetime home crowd in a game that uh, is sorely needed. So I'm going to go Bengals here. I think Bengals win this one by double digits. Oh, wow. by double digits. Wow. So after all that talk, because in 2018, <laughs> the Dolphins were 3-0, and and I think they went to New England in week four. And it, people were like, oh, the Dolphins, they're for real this year. And then New England waxed them. And it was like, oh, same old Patriots, same old Dolphins. I don't believe that's the case However, it, with this Dolphins team. However, when you see a line of four – I know there's the factors that you laid out very nicely, but you see a line against last year's AFC you know, participant in the Super Bowl and all that stuff. It seems like Vegas might not believe the Dolphins are, for, are real just yet with a four-point a, a four spread here in this game. Yeah, it is. What do you think, what do you think this, Sam, what do you think this line would be if the, the Dolphins were at home? Is, 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 I, I, if you look at the balance of the season, I'm, I'm out here picking the Bengals, and I, I think – once we get to the end of the season, I, I believe the Dolphins are a better team. That yeah. doesn't necessarily mean they're going to win this game. What do you make of the What do you make of the line here, Sam? I'm very surprised that the line is is what it is for for last week as much as anything else. You know, the, the first two weeks, Cincinnati's offensive line looking terrible and, and Burrow struggling because of it made a degree of sense because you were going up against two of the best pass rushers in the NFL, T.J. Watt and Micah Parsons, and you can say, okay, you overhaul the offensive line you brought in new talent there's still nobody there that can block those guys one-on-one like that's that's a matchup you're going to lose the Jets didn't have anybody like that and yet the Jets were still able to put Burrow under a lot of pressure and okay he played a lot better under that pressure and we talked about that on Monday but I think Miami can do a similar thing like this is going to be an issue for Cincinnati all season long and that to me kind of puts a cap on just like any degree of confidence you can have about the Bengals. Like we saw what they were able to do to Josh Allen, and Allen's, you know, got a I think a better track record than Burrow has of being able to just carry everything by himself and make it all happen. And that was enough to win that game. Do you think the offense can make enough plays down the stretch? I mean, keep in mind Buffalo was out four players in their secondary, very good players. You had sure. Yeah. Two players suffering heat stroke. You had Stefan Diggs having a full body cramp by the end of it, always going to the sideline. And yet Miami, and I know that they've had their own injuries to deal with, including one to the quarterback who is now at the center of an investigation. But Just a back injury. That, that, that game was won by the defense. Again, finding yeah. different ways to win. Can the offense potentially keep pace if guys like Chase and, and Higgins start taking advantage of things that we said, the short week in the matchup. I think that's definitely an interesting side of this matchup. I, anytime you can deploy, you know, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle, as, as good as the Cincinnati defense is, and I think it is sort of understated good, um, and Awuzie and guys like that have been playing well in the secondary, just the idea ever of Cheetah Bay Awuzie being one on one with Tyreek Hill. No, Eli Apple being one on one. Even worse. Because yeah. Tyreek's already calling out yeah. Eli Apple. Yeah, and Eli's hurt. Yeah. But so he, I'm mean, just excited to see It Eli feels Apple like there's going to be some general. plays there available for that Miami offense. Oh, man. I would have taken the Bengals, and then I saw four feels like a lot, but I, I, I like the Bengals here. You're going with the Bengals? I, I just think it is. You see this more in college. The emotional win and the, the difficulty coming back to back and all that stuff um, coming back the next week, but I think the short week and all that stuff will 
potentially catch up here. All right. For the well, Dolphins. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the, the Miami stand then. I'm I'm gonna take the Dolphins right. with four. If the Dolphins get through this though, this is what we said about the Titans last year, right? They went through that stretch and they became the number one seed at the end of the day. They went through that stretch, I forget the order, but it's like yeah. can they get by the Chiefs and the Bills and the Rams and like two other teams and they did it mm-hmm. despite all their injuries. If the Dolphins start doing that, like despite the odds against them, they get by this game and like you said, Mike they got a pretty good schedule after that. We're talking about the Dolphins, you know, with a really good record maybe by week 10. Yeah. Yeah, no no doubt. Sometimes you don't bet teams, you bet spots. And I think that this lays out quite nicely for Cincinnati, which is what I'm doing there. And maybe by the end of the game, you see Miami succumb to everything that we've outlined. And maybe Cincinnati starts pulling away in that fourth quarter a little bit. It's just such a good spot for Cincinnati if they don't. Uh, as much as we're going to be talking about Miami and, and what a great season they're in line to be having, huge question marks, I think, around Cincinnati. And while guys like us are, are talking about, yeah, they kind of got lucky last year and maybe this is a little bit of the mean, you can make it to a Super Bowl. You're not really preaching patience to a fan base. They can't <laughs> rationalize all the breaks that they got last year. Yeah. So it'll be very interesting to see how a Bengal fan base that has been devoid of hope for so long finally feels like they have something sustainable getting a reality check like that. I'd be very curious to see how that flies. I will say we've only been doing this for three weeks in terms of getting a guest on and asking them to, to predict the game. But the only guest that's nailed it so far has been Joe Thomas, who predicted the Browns by a million and was very much influenced by, you know, being a Browns legend. So I'm just not sure this is the time to go away from your Miami roots. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I don't know if you know, but I'm I'm totally workshopping the Rob Lowe fan experience uh, <laughs> this season. I was at I was actually I've seen the Bengals once this year already. I was at that Dallas game. I have tickets, and we'll see what happens. And prayers out to the the people on the west coast of Florida. I have tickets for Mahomes versus Brady on Sunday night. I'm going to be going to Sunday night football. Halloween weekend in Buffalo for that Packers game. I really like to see the best. Now, after years of being a Browns fan and watching a lot of bad football, I'm so indulging in football hedonism and the best possible storylines. And I think we actually have a pretty damn good storyline on Thursday night. Do you Uh, have the Rob Lowe hat? Have you found just the shield? Oh, yeah. Oh, I, you got it? You got I the whole set? Yeah, just, let, me, let me go grab it right now. <laughs> I've got a million <laughs> NFL hats. I, that's I, I where just I load it up. I, mean, I have a raincoat that I was wearing yesterday that is just all 32 helmets. This is, nice. this is how we do it. I mean, I, this, this is where I am, right? We're just unbiased analysts well, so, watching the football, so, rooting, for, rooting for football. That's what we're here for. Oh, look at this. Look at, look at this. The NFL. Rob Lowe. That's what we're looking for. Perfect. Yeah. The Rob Lowe. We, uh, our PR guy, David Solfaro, found a hat that was just the AFC, which I think is <laughs> wow. even, somehow yeah. even better. Well, that's like yeah, I always I'm push jealous. back against the you, college please, fans. Please, hop in the DMs and tell me where to find that. <laughs> that's like the college fans, like when people like, if you're a Pac-12 fan, you really hated this weekend. I'm like, who's out there rooting for the Pac-12? Who's out there rooting for the conference? <laughs> well, this is like, you know, we think that the, the axing SEC the pro- fans, Steve, yeah, to answer SEC your question. Fans. Oh, no, I know. We think um, axing the Pro Bowl, you know, it's a victimless crime. But there's like seven guys <laughs> or hardcore AFC fans every yeah. year that are gutted that we've just nixed the Pro Bowl. AFC, we're, we're ready to have a run. Absolutely. As AFC fans. That's our time. Yeah. Mike, yeah. thanks so much for coming on the podcast. You've been awesome. Uh, honored to be here again. Thank you guys so much for uh, for having me. We'll have we'll have you back when the NFL's playing. You know? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you can guarantee you can take it to the bank every week, the NFL's playing. Thanks, Mike. Yeah.